the virtue, genius, spirit of Rome, acknowledgement of the combined spirit of Rome and its people. Doctor and staff people, your marketing should be nothing short of genius. Thank you, baby. You are a genius. So the, the virtue genius, the spirit of Rome. Think about this. Marketing is no longer a separate division. It's the whole company. What dentists think of marketing was really advertising. Advertising is interruption marketing. Um, you're watching a movie. Uh, you want to watch the movie. You don't want to watch advertisements. And every 10 or 15 minutes, they interrupt you. And they throw out these commercials. And uh, that used to work when you only had three stations, ABC, CBS, NBC in America. And um, big consumer product companies like Procter & Gamble realize they can make an incredibly average product like Mr. Bubble and buy so many ads uh, that they could build a big brand out of it. And you'd go buy average soap, Mr. Bubble, and your kids would ask for Mr. Bubble. Um, breakfast cereals were the same things. My favorite breakfast cereal uh, when I was a little kid was Captain Crunch. And you ever listen to how they did that? They first went, uh, the big show at the time was Bullwinkle, a uh, big television show, and they went and said, Bullwinkle, can we buy the rights to Bullwinkle and make a cereal? And the uh, owner said, no, uh, but I'll tell you what, give me 60 days and I'll design a character and a concept. And 60 days later, he came back and he had um, Captain Crunch with voices and characters and a cartoon. And the cereal company said, great, it's a hit. Then they gave the orders to the uh, actual manufacturer of the product said, okay, now make me a cereal. It's going to be called Captain Crunch. Here's the theme, whole nine yards. And they just made a little square biscuit thing, no big deal. And, and they would use interruption marketing advertising. Well, that just doesn't work anymore because you don't have three channels, ABC, CBS, MSC. You have 500 channels on cable. You can't buy enough commercials to interrupt people enough times to sell a product with an after advertising, after product net income to be profitable. Now today, <coughs> your marketing has to be your product. And I keep using the same example over and over between the iPod and iRiver, or like a hot movie. Um, look, at, um, look at the iRiver. Um, you got this thing, it didn't, you know, it's hard to work, you had this little joystick, and it's all, totally frustrating. Steve Jobs just focused all of his advertising dollars into the iPod to where a moron like me, um, who uh, doesn't even feel relaxed at an ATM machine, um, could actually do this. I'm amazed how easy it is. Um, basically, you just keep pushing buttons and you, you find out what you need to do. You never get stuck. It's kind of like driving a car. Every step of the way, you just can go right, left, or straight ahead. And this is the guy that did the graphical interf interface user, um, mouse pad, all that kind of stuff. And um, another one is, um, what was the example I just gave? Besides the iPod and the iRiver um, was, oh, a hit movie, um, what, the Big Fat Greek Wedding. You know, it was just a little $5 million budget, did hundreds of millions because they didn't have a big advertising budget. They didn't have a big shooting budget. But the product was so great, who did all the marketing for my Big Fat Greek Wedding? Every happy customer that went and watched that meeting because you couldn't watch that movie without finding your own family reunion. Every character in that movie reminded you of a grandpa, an uncle, a cousin, or an aunt. So doctor marketing is no longer a separate division like advertising used to be where someone was in charge of the yellow page ad and someone's in charge of the direct mail campaign and someone's in charge of you know interrupting people doing something else and telling them about yourself. Today marketing is the whole company. It's the whole company where people come in and they experience it. And they go back to work and say, you know what? That is really an awesome dental office. I really like going there. They take my insurance. That staff is so nice. And who does all of our interruption marketing? Our happy customers. And you've heard, always heard of this word of mouth referral. Well, word of mouth referral used to be something nice to have on the side, but you could do some advertising and make it and, and counteract. But you just can't do that anymore. Marketing is the whole company. Um, it's your receptionist. Um, the, the hygienist who's deathly silent for an hour recall um, that's not talking about implants and, and bleaching and talking and, and that she didn't do it herself. And, oh, yeah, I bleached my teeth. Look at it. Marketing is every single employer. When you hire a per, an, any employee, you have to look at all four of my receptionists, all four of my assistants, all four of my hygienists and saying, does this person market the company? Uh, does she, is she passionate? Um, does, she, um, does she 
lover job? Is the work the main reward? Does she really want to stay home with kids and just comes here and because she's a hygienist, she makes more money than her husband. I mean, uh, she hates to drive, she hates to commute, she's burned out, she's whole fried. You think you're going to have that in your office and that you can interrupt people with direct mail and flyers and yellow page ads to counteract for all that and um, lack of passion? Marketing is each and several employee. Every single employee in your business either costs you money or, or makes you money. There's no sitting on the fence. Every one of your employees, you look at them and say, yeah, I give them X dollars a year, and they're just simply a cost. They, they destroy that much money. And then you go and you'll have another employee, and you'll say you get, pay them this much money, but they build this much money. They build this much value. Uh, marketing is not a department. It is your business. We can have great talent um, products, prices, and advertising, but if that sales clerk at the end of the line fails, everything fails. The buyer doesn't return. Um, and if the buyer suffers a very bad experiment, she'll tell all her friends not to come either. So everyone in your company is responsible for marketing your company. And that quote was from um, Selling the Invisible, um, a fantastic book. Um, I just love the Selling Invisible. It talked about how, you know, when you go check into a hotel room, and when the maid cleans the toilet, she puts that little paper around there because um, that's the maid selling invisible. She cleaned that toilet and it's all clean, uh, but you might not think so or you might not be reminded of that little paper around the toilet room reminds you, hey, I was here, I cleaned this toilet. And um, you go get the cup by the sink and it's got a little paper, uh, little paper lid on there. And it's not some sealed seal that'll keep out bacteria and viruses, but it's just a reminder of the maid saying, hey, Howard, I clean these glasses. These are clean glasses. They went through the dishwasher. Don't worry about that. And uh, I mean, you, you go over to your bed and they pull down the corner and they put a little chocolate mint there. Um, and, uh, you know, and she's just telling you she's selling the invisible. How do you sell the invisible? Um, the first rule of service marketing is that the service is the marketing. It's just so black and white simple. Um, marketing personality. When many prospects choose a service firm like a dental office, they are not buying the firm's credentials, reputation, or industry stature. Instead, these people buy the firm's personality. They use words like uh, phrases, I just like them. I had a good feeling about them. I just felt like it's a good fit. The words like like, feel, and felt do not refer to logic and reason, they refer to feelings. In fact, doctor, think about this. Okay, I've been practicing 20 years. Um, less than, you know, maybe five people a year ask me what dental school I went to. And when I do, I'm thinking, oh, wow. Yeah, I went to the University of Missouri in Kansas City. And I think you're going to have a comment about how they think the school's great or not great or whatever. And they go, oh, yeah, oh, Kansas City. My sister's roommate's brother's cousin one time went to Kansas City. And you're like, oh, wow. I mean, they don't care about it. They, they, they ever ask you your GPA? Do they ever ask you what you got in microbiology or physics or chem or physiology, anatomy or, um, you know, the, my hygienist was so good that in hygiene school she won the Golden Hugh Freedy Award. Do you think any single patient on the planet has ever asked him, hey, by the way, you're a hygienist, did you ever win the Hugh Freedy Golden Scaler Award? And I mean, I mean, this is the, the Oscars, the Tonys in, uh, in, in hygiene. And she won it, and nobody knows. They, they don't come in for credentials. Uh, I am my FAGD, MAGD. I don't even put them after my name. It confused people. I, I, I got tired of a little old lady saying, uh, uh, Dr. Friend, what's a, what's a FAGDA? And uh, I used to tell them, well, I got my fellowship in the Academy of Gay Dentistry. And they just kind of look at me kind of strange. And uh, when I got my MAGDA, um, you know, I mean, it's embarrassing when someone says, well, what's a MAGDA? And I say, well, here's a dentist, here's a maggot. A magda is like halfway between a dentist and a maggot. They you just confuse them. I mean, they don't understand credentials. Have you ever done a root canal? And did you ever have an intelligent patient say, Doctor, can I see the final x-ray of that root canal? And uh, are you sure that tooth didn't have four canals instead of three? And aren't we a little short on the mesial buccal cusp? And did you really get that cleaned out? Or should you have let bleach sit in there longer? Or should you have used ultrasound? I mean, did you use H26 or H plus? Um, on that gutta percha, did you use lateral condensation, vertical condensation? Um, you know, what, what, obtura, liquid gutta percha, uh, thermophil, titanium carrier, plastic carrier? They don't, they've never asked an intelligent question because they're not dentists. They just walk in there and they like the feel. It reminds me of a good friend of mine um, who has a lot of good uh, parties in town. And uh, he always talks about how, um, you know, he's in the transmission business and he's an Amco. And he's always telling me that the best transmission people in the world are downtown central Phoenix. 
but no one knows it. And there'll be some old man down in central Phoenix been doing transmissions for 40 years. Um, you, you pull up your car around the corner and he just can smell what's wrong and he hears the noise and he says, oh yeah, that was a 79 Dodge Dart and that's the year Dodge forgot to do this or that and all you need is this one little screw and he walks out in his junkyard with Doberman pinchers and takes a screw out for a dollar and fixes your transmission on the spot. He's the best and the cheapest there are. And no one in their right mind would ever go there because they're scared. You know, they're, you're in a neighborhood where there's crack dealers on the corner and prostitutes and graffiti and, and Dobermans and barbed wire on your fences. Then they pull up to an Amco. And it's premium real estate. It's clean as a whistle. It's a franchise brand name. The person walks out there in a uniform. The name tag has a clipboard. Hello, ma'am, how are you doing? And here's our checklist. We're going to hook your car up to a machine, some fancy machine with lights and whistles and do a printout. And the, the man that's going to fix your transmission is like 24 years old, growing peach fuzz, and has only done three in his whole life. And, and mom doesn't care because it's all under warranty. It's going to cost $1,000 when it could have cost 100 downtown Phoenix. And they pay $1,000 because of the way it makes them feel. They feel safer. They feel more secure. Uh, I go to McDonald's, name tags, uh, uniforms. Everybody's in a uniform and a name tag. And then I go into you know, a hospital, and, uh, and uh, someone will walk in, and you have to ask, you know, are you a doctor? Are you a nurse? Well, what are you? I mean, can you imagine being in a hospital bed and some guy with a bunch of tool belts and a green armor all and and tool belts and tattoos all over his forearms walked in and started to try to start an IV in your arm. Wouldn't you rip your arm away and say, shouldn't a nurse do that or a doctor? And what if you said, oh, I actually am a doctor, but my favorite band's the, uh, the uh, what is it, this thing's YMCA? The village people, and this is my alter ego. I always wanted to be a phone line repairman or something. I mean, I mean, you should line up your staff and say, that's a receptionist uniform name tag. They should walk up and say, oh, you're Don, you're Kim, you're Chris, you're Sandy. You should walk up to the hygienist. Oh, I can tell just by looking at you, you're a hygienist. And your name is Janet and Corey. And, and a lot of companies, you notice, like um, this year, summer vacation, we went to uh, Lake of the Ozarks down in Missouri. And um, they always had the person's name and where the kid was from. Um, it'd be, hi, I'm Jake, and I'm from California. And that just starts conversations. When we saw a girl named Kim, and she's from Arizona, and we immediately, the whole family, oh, you're from Arizona, that's where we're from. Where do you live? And she said, oh, I'm Tempe, and uh, what are you doing down here? Oh, I just want a summer job. And, and uh, so, you know, just stimulate, stimulate um, conversation. Always look for ways to make it easier to do business with you. What are they complaining about? How many times you had a person say, you know, well, if you get an opening uh, next week, uh, can you just call? Um, can you email me? And you're like, well, no, we don't. We don't really do email. The whole frickin' world does, but we don't. Um, I can call you. Interruption. See, a phone call solves distance. You're in Tucson. I'm in Phoenix. I can call you. A phone solves distance. Okay, but it doesn't solve time because you have to answer the phone right then and there. I send you an email, and it solves distance and time. Yes, I sent you an email that I have an opening tomorrow at nine. But you're out to lunch, you come back from lunch, there's the email message and you answer and email back. So emails and websites solve time and distance. Uh, phone calls and faxes and telegraphs, um, they um, mostly solve distance. Communicate daily with your customers. Do you realize that when you're talking to your customers, they can't be talking to your competitors? When you do a root canal and you call them that night and you call them a week later, and then uh, four, months, four months later, you call them two weeks ahead to remind them of their, uh, their, their six-month recall. Then you call them two days before, remind them again or whatever. Every time you're talking to your patients, they're not talking to another dentist. And don't forget to say thank you. Um, you know, they're not interrupting you. We're there for them. Um, I won't go as far as saying the customer's always right. In fact, I'll go very far to say the customer's not always right. Um, you know, I have, I have called the police on four customers in uh, 20 years. I mean, I've walked up front and some stupid man's up there using verbal abuse and I just say, hey, sir, we know there's two million people in Phoenix and we don't need um, you, You're, something's wrong with you and please leave and never come back. And then they start arguing with me and I just pick up the phone, dial 911. And, uh, I, and the, one of them I did it to, the police officer came back and said, uh, you're not gonna believe this, but you know that guy that you called the police on, I came back, he goes, he went before the judge and the judge said to him, what did I tell you the last time you came in front of my court? He said, do you remember what I told you? And the guy said, yeah, you said you didn't want to see me again. And there he was, third time. Guess what the judge gave him? A year. A year. You know, you shouldn't be yelling profanity in a dental office. So the customer is not always right. I put my, my staff 
is right, my staff comes first, and if I treat my staff like gold, they'll be good to my customers. Um, but if I'm bad with my, uh, if, if I sit there and let my staff, my customers abuse my staff, that's gonna demoralize my staff, and now my staff is demoralized for all the next patients of the day, because I demoralized in the front one. Don't be afraid to fire patients. I'll never forget when I fired up one patient who unfortunately was a very good friend of mine, and, uh, and he actually still is, believe it or not, and his wife comes in. It's kind of, it was kind of a weird deal, but basically they were all around the team huddle, and every, the whole office was cringing that my friend John was coming in at 10. And I'm just like, well, John's like the coolest guy in the world. Yeah, to you, Dr. Fran, but he's so mean and he's nasty and he says the rudest things and yada, 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 yada. And I said, how many people, and I'm just watching them cringe and they, they're like, they, they're just, literally, they, um, my front office one was like sick at eight o'clock in the morning when this guy was not gonna come in till 11. And I said, well, guys, if that's how you feel, fire him. And uh, just tell them you can't come back. And they go, they were too afraid to call them on a phone and fire them. So I called them up and I said, hey, buddy, how you doing? We talked. I said, well, hey, I'm sorry to tell you this, but uh, um, you're no longer welcome in our office. I love you to death. You're my buddy, uh, but I'm sorry. I mean, they, just, they can't handle you anymore. And he's like, are you kidding me? And I gave him a name of uh, a dentist I can't stand and uh, told him to go there. But, um, you know, staff comes first. Treat your staff like gold. They'll take care of your patients. And don't forget to say thank you to your uh, staff. So what do your patients want? Do you keep a list of things that your patients are asking for that you do not or cannot deliver? And do you just, how do you decide um, what your patients get or want? And this is all written down measurements. Like, like we can't take Medicaid or Medicare, but we track everybody and we get so many calls for it. I mean, we get 30, 40, 50 calls a month asking if we take Medicare or Medicaid. Um, or access, various different insurance plans. Uh, a big one that we don't take is Blue Cross Blue Shield, but we're getting close. And once again, if Blue Cross Blue Shield just give me a little more money for clean exams and x-rays and take away some money from root canals, extractions, dentures, and partials and crowns, I, I'd be in. But, um, you know, these are long-term problems. But the main thing is you got to keep a list. And you got to know that if you're not going to open on Saturday, you have to know that it's costing you, you know, is it cost you five new patients a month or 50? You know, not having one weekend a month or one evening a month, or maybe you do one Saturday a month. But the main thing is this, don't fly an airplane blind by the seat of your pants. Have the instruments, know your altitude, know your speed, know what's going on. And so you can decide if you want to go higher or lower, if you want to extend your hours, what you want to do. Um, and don't just think better. Try to think different. Incredible, successful services did not simply improve incrementally on existing ideas. They made radical departures. I've seen a lot of dental offices, a lot. Now, these are in, in, in affluent areas, in rich areas, where dentists realize, you know, my clientele is pretty much all um, very rich people. Um, my whole daytime clientele stay home moms with three carat diamond rings. Uh, they got to get their teeth cleaned. They also have to get their nails done. They have to get their manicures. Well, they'll add a pedicure onto a cleaning and a bunch of rich women down on the front down in Chicago. Uh, I've seen it down in Fort Lauderdale. And these rich women love it. They're pulling in in their Mercedes Benz and they're getting their, their uh, teeth cleaned while they're getting a pedicure. And I mean, all, you know, think radical departures, but don't take that idea back to, you know, the south side of Detroit and think that's going to work. Um, Consumers in the marketplace, you know, they're born to shop and they're born to work. Consumers want good prices, they want lots of choices, uh, they want top quality, fast delivery, excellent service, but the main thing is they want it all the time. So, Abraham Maslow, who um, was, uh, you know, the Albert Einstein of human behavior and his book um, back in 1998, Maslow and Management, um, he's always, he talks all day long about relationships and he says in all relationships, understanding the feelings of others is key to creating stronger relationships. We just had a, a time last week where I was, this is just last week, I was checking on a patient. She's been with me for 20 years. Um, her uh, brother-in-law used to be the editor uh, um, of the uh, local newspaper here. And when she was leaving, um, I told her, I told her, I said, well, Christine, have a great day and everything going good. And she goes, um, yeah, she goes, um, Dr. Friend, she goes, I've been coming here 20 years, and today, I'll tell you, it's the first time. Um, I, I just want you to feel like I was treated rude. And I said, well, what happened? Well, she didn't have an appointment. She just showed up when we opened. And um, the lady up front, Kim, said, you know, she came in, she got an appointment, but I need to see Howard, you know, I got this problem. And she says, um, and she said something like, well, you know, I'll, you don't have an appointment. 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do something in a minute or whatever. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It made her feel bad. And she said, you know, Kim was rude. And I said, wow. I said, Kim is the sweetest lady in the world. I, I bet if she knew she made you feel bad, she'd be sick to her stomach. And I, you know, and Christine, and then I, I walk her up front and I told Kim what Christine just told me. And oh, Kim jumped up, went and gave her a hug. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to say that. This is what happened. You know, I had five messages on the answer machine. And when you said that to me, I was listening to this or whatever, whatever. And it was just a huge misunderstanding. They all hugged each other. And uh, Christine got teary eyed and, and all's fine and all's good. But the bottom line is we, we caught it, we nipped it, it's your exit interview, uh, it, it, you know, it has to be stopped. I couldn't have Christine go home and stew on this for six months. It might have been uh, the last straw and she'll go somewhere else. Um, people are so finicky when it comes to emotions. Not what you say, it's how you say it, it's not what they heard, it's how they interpret it. And it's 90% it's emotions and 10% facts. And then on top of this problem, dentists and physicians um, speak in a dogmatic language rooted in Latin and Greece, whose certainty of tone vastly exceeds their certainty of knowledge. I mean, the average physician and dentist learns 5,000 words of Latin and Greek, and Latin is a dead language, and you don't live in Greek. And you're sitting there telling them, you know, you're pointing to an x ray, oh, yes, you have an interproximal lesion, that's why you have an irreversible pulpitis, we'll need endodontic therapy, a post core cast coverage, restoration. And they're looking at you like, what? Did you, are, are you talking to me? did he just say every time you leave the room doctor they always turn to the assistant and say what did he say and they say you got a cavity in the nerve it's going to need a root canal that's why your tooth hurts you're going to need a root canal then crown the top of it and all add it up and, and the, the assistants and the hygienist and the receptionist answer most of the questions because they don't use latin which is a dead language and you know it doesn't impress anybody when you say oh you need an mod well what, what is an mod a mesial occlusal distal what what i mean my, my rule is this if your mother never used the word lose it. I mean, when you said, Mom, I can't find my shoes, did she say, well, they're mesial buckle to your bed? I mean, you're on the occlusal side, go lingual, now buckle. There it is, see right there, the mesial distal side. What do you, I mean, if your mama didn't use the word lose it. And the only reason all those words are Latin and Greek was because of all the egos from the French and the Portuguese and the British. Um, everybody wanted to use their own language. So since no one could just use the most international language, English, uh, they had to go back and use a language um, that was dead and, and didn't uh, bruise anybody's egos. And, uh, and so they used pretty much Latin, which most of, you know, basically the Greeks about 600 B.C. to about 100 B.C. And then the, the uh, Romans from about, you know, 50, 100 A.D. B.C. to about 500 A.D. And we use those two languages because uh, it's the least ego involvement. And, uh, and that's also why I chose to use Latin for the virtues, because I didn't want to get caught up in all the politics of Hinduism versus Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism. Uh, but, you know, you learn 5,000 words of Latin and Greek, and that's great. You got your dental degree, you got your board license. Now take all 5,000 of those words and flush them down the toilet. Because my patients, 70% speak English, 30%, uh, a little less than 30% speak Spanish. And the next, my third biggest language is Farsi, Peruvian, Iranian. And, um, you know, no one in my office cares what the Latin term is for anything I do. They simply want communication. And that's why, doctor, I'll tell you that, you know, um, when I meet a dentist, I never see someone that would have been successful at Merle Lynch selling uh, 401ks or um, I don't, when I see a room full of dentists, I'm looking at a room full of engineers, a room full of programmers, um, you know, astronomy experts, physics majors. I mean, I mean, you guys still know that light travels 186,000 miles per second, 5.9 trillion miles in a year. And if you even know that, you're a geek. I can remember in dental school, uh, the most embarrassing thing I have from dental school is, uh, I mean, from undergrad, is I went to Creighton and I went there uh, in 1980 for undergrad and they closed libraries at midnight. And when I found this out, first week of school, I'm in there, go straight to the dean's office, and I'm in there with my buddy who's now an endodontist in Phoenix, and uh, we go in there and we say, you know, we're paying all $6,000 a year tuition, and the, fa you know, the fact that you close these libraries down at midnight, that is just unconscious, intolerable. These things should be open all night long. And that dean just got up and he walked around, he put his arm around me, he says, you know, Howard, at midnight, maybe you should just go to bed. And I look back at that and think, what a loser, because I remember always coming back to the library with my friends that are dentists. Um, Randy Kerwin, who's in Kansas, Gary Asoli in Hawthorne, New Jersey, uh, Dovkin, who's now at Endodontist in uh, Phoenix here. And uh, we'd be coming back from the libraries at midnight, 
and uh, the business students, they'd all be coming in with their girlfriends, drinking beer, and they'd always look at us, and they'd, you know they were always thinking, losers, and we were always looking at them like disgusting, baller. I mean, I hated business students. I thought they were all lazy and drank too much and just went to school to party, and you know they were looking at us thinking, a bunch of geek losers. Well, the bottom line is, we spent all those years, we learned physics and chemistry and microbiology, all that stuff, but you know what? No one understands what we're saying. That's why the most successful physicians always have someone else present the treatment plan, the problem. You know, we, we can tell them the disease, we can answer the questions, but we're best. You know, we'll, we'll, I like to go do my exam, um, but I like to go have the hygienist go in there and do the probings, um, chart existing, um, let them answer all the questions, let them do almost everything they can because they speak English, they speak Spanish, they speak Farsi, and their, um, their certainty of tone um, is there is very makes people feel good so uh, think about that um, and also when you're talking about languages I thought I found the book the five lung languages um, incredibly outstanding for uh, managing not only your wife your children your staff and your patients and that is the five love languages you talk about people have about five different emotional love languages uh, um, physical touch words of affirmation quality time gifts and acts of service and you know, I was married to my sweetie for about uh, probably 18, 19 years before I figured this out. It used to blow my mind that at Christmas I'd give her a $30,000 pair of earrings and you know, VVF1, full care, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And she wouldn't, she wouldn't even, you know, she wouldn't even give me a nod. I mean, basically just looked at them, oh, those are nice, put them in her purse, didn't even put them on. I thought, well, damn, 30000 Well, she's not into gifts. And then I found out later that she was mad because I bought her a pair of diamond earrings, uh, but she's acts of service number five, and you know the day before she'd asked me to clean out the garage, and with her, and I said no because I always thought, well, why should I clean out the garage? I mean, um, we have maids, we have people to do the pool. We uh, shouldn't the maid do it, or shouldn't someone else do it? Can't I be doing something more productive? Well, it's, it wasn't about productivity. It's that, it's that she's my wife, and she wanted to clean out the garage with me. Now, I think that's insane. I mean, I'm number one physical touch. I'd rather go jump in bed. She wants to clean the garage. Uh, some women want gifts. Um, some people like words of affirmation. They like praise. And that's what we're always talking about, talking about baby steps. Um, you know, give them every time they take a step or a walk or bring home a report card. You make a big deal out of all the little things. And then the big things will just happen. But if you wait to give them praise of the big things, um, they're never going to come if you don't give a person who thrives on words of affirmation and praise. And then number three is quality time. I got four boys. And old Zach, you know, um, Zach doesn't want my baby. He doesn't want any gifts. Um, you can go buy him all the toys in the world, and he don't care. But uh, I found out that, you know, but he'll come up to you, and he'll say, Dad, you want to play Foursquare, which I, I don't understand Foursquare. I mean, especially when it's just me and Zach, because there's four squares, but there's only two of us. We're in two squares, and all you do is hit the ball back and forth. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what's fun about it. But, you know, when Zach asks to go play Foursquare, that he wants time with you right now. And you can't sit there and say, well, okay, well, Zach, I'm busy right now, and I'm going to come back, and I'll do that uh, two hours later, because then you come back two hours later, then you don't want to play. And then maybe in the, um, so when they come and ask for time, so the same thing your staff. Like, when your assistant will come up and say, hey, Dr. Fran, you want to go to lunch today? Well, I'm sitting there thinking, well, i got a million things to do. i got emails to do. I want to do this. Uh, I, I'd rather go to lunch with my wife, or I want to go. i got to do this or that or this. But you know what? This is my staff member. She's been with me for 19 years. And she hardly ever asked me to go to lunch. And she asked me if I want to go to lunch with her. She wants quality time. She wants time. And then I'm going to lunch thinking, well, is she going to ask me something? Is something going on with, with uh, sterilization or is it the ordering supplies or whatever? And nothing happened. She, she just talked, you know, for whatever, for an hour. She wants quality time. And when she asks for it, you got to give it to her. Um, and words of affirmation. I mean, um, you should be able to know you're, you're like a football coach. You have to be a genius in these love languages. Um, when these, uh, when with patients too. I mean, when you go in there and my, your hygienist has to tell you, um, you know, love languages. She has to say, hey, this person, when they came in, they were a pig. They missed their appointments. You know, five years later, we finally got down to no bleeding points. He's finally all three millimeters or less. My gosh, when he started, he's fours and fives and sixes. He would never floss. And, and, and really, really give them some praise. 
and you go in there and say, gosh darn, Frank, you're doing so good, and just give them all this affirmation. Don't make people feel bad, like, Frank, you're a pig. You're a pig. Your dad's a pig. Your mother's a pig. How come your whole pig family doesn't floss? Make them feel bad. They never come back. You know, there's still a lot of hygienists out there that think their job is to be the mean person and scold everybody and tell them everybody what they're doing wrong. And they make everyone feel bad and they never come back. That doesn't work with raising a child. It doesn't work with your own children. It doesn't work with your staff. Why would it work for your patients? Um, so learn the five love languages. Learn the difference between people who want physical touch versus praise and words of affirmation versus quality time. And another thing on quality time, um, sometimes you'll go in there and you'll do an exam and you can do your recall exam three, four minutes and blow out of there. Uh, but the patient says to you, um, hey, Dr. Frank, and they start talking. And some people come in and they just want some of your time. Some people pride efficiency. And these are people who'd rather have everything done in 30 minutes and wham, bam, just get it done and leave. Uh, probably engineers are more like that or scientists. But some people want some quality time. Uh, I've got 20, 30 um, um, little old ladies that come into my office that are between 70 and 90 and I swear they won't leave till they give me a big hug goodbye they'll stand out front and say well I want to tell Dr. Fran goodbye and they'll come back and say Dr. Fran Martha's up there you know she's 92 and she wants to tell you goodbye and I know what that means she wants a big old hug she wants a big old kiss and how are you doing and how's your grandbabies and and they just want time so understand um, the five love languages and apply them to your wife, your children, your staff, your patients, because you are simply in the people business. And remember yourself, um, Milton Friedman in his, uh, probably the number one book I've ever read in the world was Free to Choose by Milton and Rose Friedman. The, these guys are um, Nobel laureate economists. They're simply the best. And they lived a lovely life of example, uh, been married 50, 60 years. Um, of the one million people in the civil service working for the government who were eligible last year for merit raises, only 600 did not receive them. Almost no one is fired. Less than 1% of federal workers lost their job last year. So do you really think 99% of the workers for the government really deserve to keep their job? The reason the government is so pathetic is because of the unions. And basically, wherever the unions go, whether it's automotive industry, then look for all the automotive plants to shut down and go all around the world. Um, if they go into textiles, look for textiles to shut down and go somewhere else. Whenever a union touches an industry, it makes it so sick and ill that it either goes to bankruptcy or moves to a foreign country. And it's still shocking to me that 11% of Americans are involved in some trade union and unions are basically uh, basically if I go steal your wallet I'll go to jail but if a hundred of us get together and form a union and go up to management and say give us more money oh that's legal so you can't steal one at a time but you can steal a million at a time and the government silver service union is so pathetic and that's why the government is pathetic because the government can't go in there and say hey these 20 people have a very negative attitude, it hurts everyone else's morale, they upset our patients, they don't, they're not with the program, and we can't fire them because they're a union. Teachers are the most pathetic. Not only do they say Howard Franny is a doctor, dental surgeon, has a master's in business, can't teach first graders because they don't have their, their little union certificate, their teacher's degree, uh, but teachers get tenured. Can you imagine your hygienist coming to you, well, I've been here seven years, so I'm tenured, can't fire me. And now all those smiles are gone, I'm getting here late, I'm tenured. The only people that tenure people are the government. That's why they're pathetic. And what you have to do is you have to realize that the product is you, the people. Act genius. Hire genius people. Um, hire people that love dentistry. And by the way, what is the difference between leadership and management? Management gets you to change your behavior with force, manipulation, coercion. Um, you come late, I'm going to write you up. Um, you know, you get your, I'm going to give you a paint slip, three paint slips, and you're going to get, you know, sent home without pay, yada, yada, yada. And leadership gets you to change your behavior without force, manipulation, or coercion. And I don't want to go religion on you, but um, how many times, you know, you know, you have all these people, you know, what would Jesus do? How many times did you sit there and think, well, you know, what would Martin Luther King Jr. do? Or what would Martin Luther King um, do 1500 or you're sitting there thinking um, many times in economics I, you know and I'm thinking about this and that, I just think well how do you think Milton Friedman would think about this and uh, and you know and or what would Jesus do or this or that but when these people are standing on your shoulders and they're talking in your head that's true leadership I mean Gandhi I mean um, uh, Janis Joplin's song we have nothing to lose you know um, and when you have nothing you have nothing to lose 
And the bottom line is, when people are changing your behavior, and they're not even alive, they're not even there, they're not even standing around you, that's true leadership. You need, to, you need a true leadership, but you live by example, and you create the environment, and you attract the people where your people want to do good. Um, work is the reward. They, they see it as a challenge to get a six-year-old little girl to quit crying uh, so they can numb her up and do an MO. They don't go in there and say, hey, you're a brat, you're spoiled rotten suburban. If you cry one more time, I'm going to slap you. Now you're going to hold open, and mom, get out of the room, and, and I'm going to strap her down. And You know, these pedons that use papoose boards, I swear to God, I think they should have their license taken away. I mean, I mean, if you have to strap a child down, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs. I mean, you know what I wish someone would do? I wish someone would go in with, with uh, hidden cameras in dentistry and film a bunch of this because I don't think 20, 20, or 60 minutes knows about this. Those techniques are entirely unnecessary. Um, I have seen Peter on us, myself. I find it a huge challenge when someone will say, well, we can't get Megan to cooperate. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll rise the okay. I'm not going to use force and coercion and go in there and beat her up and spank her. I'm going to go in there and talk to her. And, and you start talking to her, and then you find out now she's not really crying. She's whining. And basically, she's just scared. And that's normal. And I'm going to go over the instruments with her, and I'm going to tell her what she's going to do. And I'm going to give her a reward. And some rewards are big. Like, I got that little Barbie doll dentist girl. I mean, that's 10 bucks, but you know what? Megan will lay down there and let you give her a pulpotomy if she really thinks she's going to get a $10 Barbie doll. But um, match the reward. Um, you know, some want a balloon, some want a toy of the basket, some want, you know, whatever. But raise the occasion. The reward is the work. And surround yourself with people. You know, little kids are interesting. Um, they'll come home from school and they'll bring home a friend. And, you know, my Friday night, my four boys, you know, most of my fr boys' friends, I mean, think about this, you know, 20% of baby boomers had no kids. 20% had one kid, and the big 40, 50% had two kids, and it's usually a boy or a girl. So if you're a boy only child, um, you want to play at our house, it's got four boys. Or if you've got a boy and you just have a sister, our house is more exciting. And uh, boys like boys. So my four boys turns into eight to 12 boys on any given Friday or Saturday night. And um, I watch who they invite over, and they only invite the people over they like and want to play with. And then I see government workers going into their jobs, and they hate half the people in there. They're negative. They're toxic. They got caustic personalities. No one can fire them. And then I, I still sell, um, see a dental officer or dental officer, dental officer. They'll tell me what their problem is, and they'll tell me, like, what the hygienist is doing. I'm like, well, God. I mean, what does she have to do to get fired? Does she have to park her car in the waiting room? Does she have to smack you? Um, would she have to, you know, cut you up, use force? I mean, what does this dysfunctional negative person have to do to get fired? So surround yourself with people who build you up. Surround yourself with people. When I'm driving to work, about the last block, I almost giggle thinking about what Dr. Dominic's going to say to me when I walk in there, this, that. He just makes me feel good. Everybody's funny. Um, it, I think people come 15, 20 minutes early to work just to say hi to everybody, catch up. So what did you do last night? How did the baseball game go? You know, how was your kid's parent-teacher conference? So um, be a leader. Don't use management. And uh, think about that. Thank you. Hi, the virtue of solace, which means safety, concern for public health and welfare. Use digital x-rays to lower radiation and enable your patient to achieve mastery. Very good, Greggy. Thank you. And uh, I just was, last year, I forgot to say, Eric set the high school record for most wins as a freshman, 21 wins at Desert Vista High School. And you set the all-time middle school record, uh, most wins uh, through middle school. So uh, this is a wrestling family, which means uh, Zach takes the brunt of this. Sorry, Zach, but uh, thanks a lot, guys. All right, no problem. So the virtue solace, meaning safety, public health and welfare. No one could have predicted the fall of film x-ray. I mean, no one. Um, you know, we had this big, massive, great CIA and military. No one saw Pearl Harbor. No one saw 9-11. No one saw the Berlin Wall falling down. And uh, everybody likes to backseat drive the government, tell them how miserable they are. Uh, but look at Free Enterprise. No one saw film x-ray. If you just said in the year 2000, more Americans would have digital cameras in 2005, um, you would have been laughed off the stage. And film has just been a plummet. And uh, because digital, it's faster, it's right there. 
Um, it, it's basically, this is what we're living through right now is a digital revolution where the whole world is going to get rid of analog, they're going to get rid of tape and film, and all these uh, um, information pieces are going to communicate with each other. Um, the dental assistants love digital x-rays because they take the x-ray, they can immediately see if they got it. I mean, um, say it's an endo check. You know, I, I still always check my root ZX apex locator. And, and the reason I do it, for one reason, my attorney, Jeffrey Tonner, who's probably the greatest dental malpractice attorney in the United States, or, and he's on Dental Town all the time, he says, you know, your, how do you record your apex locator reading? I mean, it's very good. He says, when, if you ever got sued, they're not getting out of root ZX, they're getting out of an x-ray. And you see it right then and there. But what I like about it is going back to that last slide where I said, uh, help your patients achieve dental mastery. When we were doing this Kodak film, we didn't give the patients a film and, you know, and a little bitty film. And when you duplicate it, the, every time you duplicate it, the quality gets worse and worse and worse. In fact, I always said, I didn't know if it was me or my eyes or my brain, but I could never read a duplicate. I used to always tease that an eagle or a hawk couldn't read a duplicate x-ray. How could a doctor read it? And now with these digital x-rays, I get to print them out. And we're not talking a little bitty one inch by one inch Kodak film. You're talking about <coughs> large sheet of paper. Um, you can even put in special paper. I mean, really nice paper to get a, these beautiful printouts. And the patient gets to go home. Here's a lady who gets to go home and she can show it to her husband. Uh, um, she can mail it to her insurance. She can go get a second opinion. I give every single patient when they leave a copy of their notes of their x-rays, of their pantograph, whatever, their treatment plan, the fees, the cost. They'll leave with four or five sheets of paper. They would never have to call me up. And, and uh, if, let's say they wanted a second opinion. It's very hard for social animals to say, you know, I want to do it, Doc, but, you know, I think in 2005, I mean, it's kind of smart to get a second opinion. Trust me. If I had, if someone told me I had prostate cancer or lung cancer um, and, um, and I went and they said they wanted to do, do this, the surgery, that surgery, I mean, come on, I'm a doctor. I know I would get a second opinion. In fact, no matter what disease you have, it's always the same four hospitals that are always first, second, third, or fourth place in any disease. And what are they? Mayo Clinic, John Hopkins, Sloan, and Houston. And uh, I would actually, if my wife had cancer, I had cancer, or, or we're going down, I would actually think I would go to all four of them just to see if anybody has some cutting edge thing. And when your patients come in, you tell them they need two root canals and a bridge or whatever, they feel bad socially to ask for a copy of their x-rays. And then they would say, well, and what if I went back there to have it done? Then the doctor wouldn't trust me because I got a second opinion. I tell my patients, you know, only an idiot would have massive uh, any surgery done and not get a second or third opinion. Uh, but giving them their x-rays, it makes it all help, easy to do, easy to get used to. It helps the patient achieve dental mastery. Um, I wish, my, my dream next is that, I hope they come out with like those little, uh, um, those magnetic strip cards. So when the patient leaves, every time they're done, I could just run a strip through and then they could go home and they could open up their x-rays, they could enlarge them, they could email them to a friend, they could go into some public dental chat room, talk about it. Because remember, the reason I want, the, and dentist, you know, they, by and large, is tradition, they do not want the patient to have the x-rays. If the patient says, I want to copy my x-rays, the doctor says, I own the x-rays. And that's legally true because you have a big trade union. Um, but she says, uh, well, I want a second opinion. Well, who is it going to be? You want to know. And then you say, well, I'll send the extra to the other doctor because, I mean, it reminds me, you know what the, uh, you know what dentists remind me of? Um, you know, we were raised Catholic and, you know, Martin Luther, 500 years ago, was a Catholic priest and he wrote these 96 things wrong with the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church didn't want to hear it. But, you know, 500 years later, the Catholic Church agreed to all those things. Um, they used to face the altar and speak in Latin. Nobody knew what the heck they were saying, and all he wanted to do was turn to the people, speak their language in German, and translate the Bible into German, and the Catholic Church sent the Knights of Columbus and tried to kill the guy, and they chased him all the way around to England. He actually fled, he married, he ran off with a nun that's in the exact same convent as my oldest sister, Mary Kay, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then I think they had like 10 children. But what do we do? Only doctors and dentists still speak in Latin, and we write prescriptions in Latin. Now, how backward is that? You're writing a prescription in Latin and your patient speaks 
English or Spanish or Farsi, and the only person who can interpret it is the bishop or the monsignor or a pharmacist or another doctor. This is not consumer mastery. And, and you do that, and you don't practice transparency. You act like North Korea. And here's what the reality is. When your dental assistants, and look at your hygienist. They know all dental knowledge. So 99.9% .9 of them have all their teeth at 65. See, when you withhold knowledge from the average people, they can't achieve self-mastery. And the media does this all day long. Every time I've ever been interviewed for the media for anything, water fluoridation, whatever, I'll start explaining it. Uh, oh, no, you can't say that, you sir. you got to realize the average Phoenician, you know, you got to get aim at a sixth grader. And it's like, no, the media has been dumbing everything down, assuming everyone's dumb, and that unless you go to a brick building and get a, a college degree or a, a, a BS, which stands for BS, or MS, which is more of it, or a PhD, piled higher and deeper, um, anybody who reads is intelligent. These people who go to Barnes & Noble twice a month and read books, they're intelligent. Uh, I would say 80% of the instructors that I met all through nine years of college could not run a Dairy Queen. So basically, I want these patients to have all their x-rays, all their perio charting, all of my notes, and I'm gonna try, and I try to use as many English, Spanish, and Farsi words I can, because I firmly believe if that patient knew everything I knew or my hygienist knew, they'd floss their teeth every morning and night, and they'd never lose their teeth. Uh, they would get their teeth clean every six months, and if they did all those things, they would not be very valuable to me. If they floss every morning and every night and got their teeth clean every six months, I could see them for 40 years and maybe, possibly, not make any a single net income dollar. Who do we make all of our money off? Uh, the people who don't floss. I mean, there it is in a nutshell. That, that's about 90% of all the money we make. And uh, if this whole nation started flossing every morning and night, um, we dentists would probably have to get a paper out uh, but that should be the goal. And so helping them by going digital, uh, I can send my insurance claims out faster. Uh, when they take their bite wings, they instantly say, I think this is funny because, you know, here's these first two bite wings are perfect. And here they get a nice cone cut. And uh, but I guess they decide that's okay. And this is when they got a cone cut. But the bottom line is that instant feedback. <coughs> I wasn't there. I don't know the patient situation. Um, another thing I like to do is now that we, you know, we basically have two cavities. We have flossing cavities in between the teeth, and then we have these pit and fissure cavities. And you're sitting there with a diagnetic reading on this tooth right here, and it's about 50, but they don't know what that means. And you could go around and write, you know, that's probably about a 25, that's probably a 30, that's probably a 50, that's probably a 75, that's 25. And in a way, it loosely translates as a percentage of how deep it is to the nerve. Like, this is like 75% of the way towards this pulp horn, and this is like 20% of the way, and this is about a third, and here's another uh, high pulp horn, so this is about a third of the way down. And by explaining that, you know, doctor is Latin word docere, meaning to teach, so printing out these x-rays, putting them on a clipboard, and explaining to the patients, and by the way, I don't want to be the one explaining this, because number one, I'm the most expensive person in the office, but number two, I know the most words of Latin and Greek, so I, so remember, years of education negatively correlates to communication. They learned this in the malpra um, medical malpractice um, like 30, 40 years ago. There's a lot of research this, Harvard Business Review, Regina Herschlinger quotes a lot of this literature where, you know, you go back to 1970, uh, people get a bypass, what they, what doctors call a cabbage, a C-A-B-G, a coronary artery bypass graft, uh, where they go grab artery somewhere and go uh, replace a coronary artery that feeds the heart. And um, people get all that surgery and they'd find this huge scar on their leg and they'd immediately think it was an accident. So they'd run to an attorney and say, my God, I went in for a heart surgery and look at my leg. And the lawyer would be, oh my God, somebody screwed up big time. Well, they'd start a whole lawsuit going. And it would go, it, and now the hospital's already been served, been, you know, they're incurring legal fees, trying to get out of this thing. And sure, they get out of it because it's a artery bypass graft. Uh, but no, and they're saying, well, how, who the heck explained this to the patient? And they always say, the cardiovascular surgeon. And no one has a word idea what he's saying. And they realize that if the cardiovascular surgeon explained it, and they went in the next day and gave you a 10-point quiz, you'd get nothing right. And then if a registered nurse explained it, you miss like eight out of 10. And if the receptionist up front explained it, who never went to nursing school, never went to med school, and didn't have one day of college, you could get eight out of 10 right. Um, I still think the greatest communicators in the world were 
um, Oprah Winfrey, Bill Clinton, and Ronald Reagan. Those, those are the only three I've seen in my lifetime. Oprah Winfrey could talk to a tree. She ne her sentences are never more than 14 words long. It's always, she just speaks succinctly, slowly, concisely. I mean, she, Oprah Winfrey is the epitome of the Gettysburg Address. I'll explain the entire Civil War and why we're going to lose a quarter, a third of a million men in 272 words. I mean, she's just beautiful at it. And Oprah Winfrey would just simply say, you know, you have two types of cavities, a flossing cavity. See where these two teeth touch? Exactly where they touch. Not up here, not down here. Exactly where they touch, there's no air. Those bugs are so small, your eye can only see a thousand microns wide. But those bugs are only five microns wide. There'd have to be 200 bugs side by side for your human eye to see Streptococcus mutans, an anaerobe. And they're right at that point, these bugs are so small, they can only eat sugar. They can't eat steak, chicken, ham, and broccoli. And they're sitting there right at that point eating sugar. And everything that eats excretes. And as it eats sugar, it excretes acid, softens up, and eats their way into the tooth. And here's an existing flossing filling. And right here in the same tooth, now you got a flossing cavity on the other side because you eat sugar. Average American eats about 200 pounds of sugar a year per person. And then we have these other cavities and these pits and fissures. And the only way sugar can get in there is with the help of acid. And that's only Coke. I mean, Coke and Pepsi, you know, is carbonic acid and, and nine teaspoons of sugar. So if you drink sugar in acid, you'll get these cavities. And if you eat sugar and don't floss, you get these cavities. Now, if you don't drink Coke and Pepsi and pop, and you floss your teeth and brush every morning, every night, I mean, I have not had a cavity since 1980. I haven't had one cavity in 25 years. I routinely meet 65-year-old hygienists who had not had a cavity in 45 years. And there's the only thing we do differently is uh, we'll drink iced tea without sugar, and the people will drink iced tea with sugar. they got to put in that extra few teaspoons of sugar just to make sure a third of them lose all their teeth. And I'll floss every morning and floss every night, and 90% of America won't. But how many women will get up and spend an hour doing their hair and their makeup and this and that, but they don't have 30 seconds to floss their teeth? Um, I love The other thing about digital x-rays is when you had film, you were always, the patient was here, and you were always pointing to the film. You weren't making eye contact. You have to make eye contact to talk to other social animals because only when they're making eye contact are they listening. When they break eye contact, they're processing. And, you, and the, if I had to say the main complaint in dentist selling, why they can't sell, is because they just keep selling and selling and selling and selling and selling. Wait, they never close. And how you close is simple. In dentistry, since there's less than 10 questions are going to ask. You know, is it going to hurt? Uh, when are you going to do it? Will my insurance pay? How much will it cost? What's it going to look like? Will it be white, two color, gold? You know, there's, there's, oh, there's so few questions they can ask. So uh, think of it like this. Let's say you go to a doctor. I go to a doctor and he says, uh, uh, we just did some blood work and you, you got some green gangy golf ball growth way up in your uh, colon. And, um, and we got to take it out. I would just immediately stop. Okay, there's uh, some green, gangy golf ball growth in my colon needs to come out. Um, you know, how long am I going to be laid up? I mean, when can I go back to work? Uh, when could you do this? What, what did the doctor say? No, shut up, shut up, Howard, don't. Say, please, please, I'm the doctor. Let me just keep talking. Then he keeps talking about what it's made out of, and he brings in a tray of them so I can see them, and he has a slide projector show and goes to the guy who invented it, and when it was discovered, I don't care. I, what, what's the bottom line? You got some green golf ball thing we got to cut out, and we could do it today, and you could go back to work tomorrow. It's a thousand bucks. Your insurance pays 800. Got to give me two. I mean, just get to the point, get to the bottom line. And when doctors are looking at x ray, they just keep talking and talking and talking and talking. And a lot of times, the patient's already decided to do the treatment, and then the dentist talks them out of it. So, by maintaining eye contact, here's the problem um, you have a little cavity here, we need a filling. And then she, she nods her head yes, and she breaks eye contact with you, looks at the x-ray, and then just shut up. Your easiest close is to just shut up. They break eye contact. They look at the x-ray. They look where your fingers point. They come back to you, and they say, well, like, are you going to do this today? Or when, when? And if they say, like, are you going to do this today, they bought, close, change screens, print out the x-ray, give it to her. Then you bring in your dental assistant. Um, here's Christine, fluent Spanish. And she brings up the treatment plan. She's entering the treatment. 
Uh, it's going to say how much it costs, yada, yada, yada. Uh, the patient has a remote control. They can be watching, you know, CNN or ESPN or whatever. And then uh, same thing with the hygienist. When the hygienist, like, you come in for a cleaning, I mean, you, you got to be scheduled for a recall. So who better to do it than the person that just was spending an hour with you? There's a little baby Jordan up there. Um, each one of our staff has their own room, and, and that's the way teachers should do it, have their own room. And uh, they, they, every room is done differently, and it really is their room. And I think when they come to work and they've got a computer in every room, they have their own email account, they have their own whatever, whatever. They love their room. They, they dress up with their baby pictures. Um, here's the pano room where uh, here's Corey, the hygienist, taking a pano on a patient. And, um, and you know, once again, she can look at it and explain everything to the patient. I'll come in uh, and uh, do the exam right there. We don't have to tie up a room or seat them or any of that kind of stuff. Um, these panos, these digital panos are so fantastic. Uh, there's Jan, my little workhorse warrior. And uh, we had these wireless keyboards, and uh, they were actually a nightmare because no matter what we did, sometimes you would be typing and then it would affect another computer in another room. Uh, that was a huge nightmare for us, and we got rid of those. Maybe they make them better today, I don't know, but it uh, cost us about three months of uh, bleeding ulcers. Want to know why computers would freeze and others would close and all these kind of things. And then we bring in uh, Cammie, and uh, Cammie, are you out there? You got to come here. Real quick, come here. I just think this is so cute. When we filmed the 30 day dental MBA, it was April of 1999, and now this is. August or September of 2005, and look, you're pregnant there. Look, I'm still pregnant. <laughs> She's still pregnant. This has been a long delivery for Cammie. She's been pregnant for about, what, six years in April, May, June, July, August? Six years and four months you've been pregnant. So I, I suggest you go to the hospital <laughs> and maybe try cesarean. And that baby in there was Mercedes. What's this one going to be, Cammie? I don't know. Did you have an ultrasound? But she has a Zachary, like I have a Zach, and she had a Mercedes, like I wanted a Megan. So uh, this one, I'm sure, whatever it is, will be perfect. But uh, And then you bring in um, an assistant, receptionist, whoever, and immediately put in the charges, the fees, whatever. This is, like I say, the business is so simple. Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Um, being digital up front, this is still fantastic. Uh, all that information, the, the schedule's been entered. They don't have to walk up a chart. She doesn't have to enter information. Going digital from an operations and logistics point of view speeds up so much. Now remember, where are all the bottlenecks in a dental office? Without any doubt, it's the 80-20 rule. 80% are up front, checking people in, checking people out. And the biggest problem up front is you cannot measure or predict the flow when the phone rings. The phone might not ring for 40 minutes and three people call at the same time. So by having everything digital, if you know it has to be done, it's done in the back. Um, the assistants and the hygienists, they would write up the notes, the treatment notes, um, update, um, you know, any information. Are there any changes in health history? Is this still your phone number? Yada, yada. Everything's done in the back because <coughs> I have four receptions up front, but this person's checking out. But if that phone rings and you see one of the lines is lit up, and we have eight lines. Um, my gosh, that phone rings. She has to be able to pick that up and have 10, 20 minutes. And sometimes we'll have to ask the patient to move over or, um, or go to the next booth or whatever. And there's 1999, and there was 2000. That was our goal. 2000, we were going to get rid of paper. Now, when I say that, that's tongue in cheek. Because we were going to get rid of paper. And at that time, I was so green and naive. I thought if you got rid of the chart, got rid of the film with digital x rays, got rid of the chart, and you'd be paperless. My God, had I no idea that every day we print out the schedule and we tape that up in six different rooms. And it took another six months to figure that out. Uh, when, people, when you give people um, um, their forms to sign, uh, consent forms. And then we had to work with a guy named DJ to find some digital signature. That, that took another six months. Every time we turn around, we still find that we're using more paper. Um, are we using any paper now? Does anybody know? We still use a little bit, and you know what it, what it's for now. Okay, routing slip is that right? But we're you know we're still down to just a few pieces of paper, and that's one of the dis some some of these practice managing errors are so brilliant they have great results. And I'm gonna sp spend a minute on one. Sandy Pardue 
is one of the greatest practice management consultants in dentistry. Um, she, she's up there in the league. You know, her and Sally McKenzie, Linda Miles, uh, those three are just the, uh, the, the, the bedrock of practice management consulting. And uh, Sandy Berdu has doubled production and net in a dozen, two dozen, three dozen offices on Dental Town alone that I personally know. Um, good friends of mine, some of the best guys in the industry. Jerome Smith is probably the best dental implantologist in the world after Dr. Brandmark and Carl Misch. It'd probably be Jerome Smith. And, um, but she's coming to our office. She has all these great ideas, but it's all paper and all these paper systems. And that's fine if my practice management software did it. But, you know, the, point, the way I'm trying to point that out is I never want to make you think that I believe that there's only one way to do it, my way. And my way is right and every other way is wrong. Sandy Perdue and I are two class examples of uh, Howard wants to go completely paperless and Sandy Perdue wants to have basically a paper form contract system for everything you do. So it's just a different culture, just like um, they've ever seen the Marriott and the Hyatt or the Hyatt and the Hilton. Um, the difference in McDonald's and Burger King. Um, great companies that just do things differently. Um, checking patients out now, and uh, now they took down that uh, smile face and put down a little cabinet. Uh, I just can't tell you. Uh, there's Don, there's Kim, there's Chris, and I'm very sad because I just found out yesterday she's moving back to Maine. She's taking, I, that's so tough when you have just great employees and then her and her husband moved out here years ago and they're getting homesick. They're all moving back to Maine. And I'm telling her, you know, this is Phoenix, the best winters in the world, 70 degrees. She's going to go to Maine and freeze half to death. Uh, there's 1999. Look at all those charts, 12,000 charts. And look at that. That's the year 2000. That was five years ago. And, uh, you know, not, that's today. Now they got that. Uh, I don't know why, but whatever. And um, there's the front office staff. And uh, there's Don. There's Kim. Everybody thinks this guy in the middle is Fabio, but I want to tell you, that's, that's actually me. Uh, there's my house manager, Sandy, and there's uh, Chris, who I'm losing again. It's so tough when you try to slow down staff turnover, but it's very hard because um, <coughs> healthcare, 90% of the jobs are women, and if their husbands get a job transfer, they just pack up and go. Um, when they, uh, you know, they're moving back to family. Phoenix also is a tough area because it's so transient. For instance, the area of Phoenix I built, I live in, it didn't even exist 30 years ago. Whereas I go back to like Wichita, Kansas, you can, you can go on a city block where every single person was born in Wichita on that block. A lot of them were born in that house or three streets away. But Phoenix, is, Phoenix and LA, some of these bigger cities are so transient that it's 10 times harder to have a staff member stay with you 20 years in Phoenix or LA than it is in Piedmont, Kansas, where your whole relative was born, raised, reared, and died there. And there's my number two, Lori Zalowski, who, you know, um, I can't say behind every successful man, successful woman, because that sounds, it just sounds sexist to even me, but, but, you know, my wife, Lori, Jan, uh, my executive assistant, Cammie, um, I have so many, so, somebody did say, well, how do you do all this? How do you have a practice, a family, all these things like that? I'm telling you, it's just, you got to surround yourself with people who basically make sure that you basically have to do nothing. Uh, there's Sandy shredding the charts and uh, Lori got mad at her for shredding the charts and we had to go buy some Ben and save them just to make the lawyers happy. Um, but issues in information technology, IT dentists who are not committed to continuing personal development quickly become obsolete. Those who cannot similarly develop their employees find their business obsolete. And, uh, and then one last thing on this, uh, going digital, make more calls. Uh, be industrious. Remember that virtue, industrious? Um, I can't believe how many times a patient will come in to a dentist and they'll give them a five, six, seven thousand dollar treatment plan and they don't schedule for it and that, that's the end of it. I mean, I'll be driving to work, maybe before I leave for lunch, maybe before I go to home, maybe driving home from work, and I'll have a little a list, list of those. And then I'll get in my car and I'll have a 15 minute drive to work and I'll say, you know what? I'll, I'll call them out. I'll say, Marianne, you know, I, I feel bad because you came in there and you had a bunch of questions and a big treatment plan. And that was a Monday morning. We were very busy. We had emergencies. I think there's a full moon, but I just felt that 
I thought when you left, you probably had another question that I didn't answer. And every single time, oh my God, I can't believe you called me. That is so sweet. Because I did have a question. Yada, yada, yada. You know, could it be metal or gold? Or is it going to come out? Or, you know, how much work will I miss? Or, um, you know, I, yeah, I went to your periodontist friend, but he said I couldn't have an implant. I'd have to have a bone graft. And I didn't know what you thought of that. But my gosh, if you walked on a car lot, and didn't buy the car, but test drove one and was drooling all over the 21 inch wheels and falling in love with this thing and then left. Do you think that car salesman would call you again? Yeah, hey, he call you once a week. And lots of time, and remember the difference in a car salesman and dentist, if a car salesman calls you, all they're gonna do is talk you into buying a car. If I call you up and talk you into it, you're getting optimum oral health to make you healthier. So make more calls, thank you. The virtues vertes, vertes, courage, especially leaders with society like you. Interns data will integrate with dentist data f for evidence-based dentistry. Never believe your own press clipping. Great job, Zach, and great job, boys. I think you guys showed a lot of courage coming here today to the film studio and helping out your dad and I with this project. Thanks so much. You guys did great. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye guys. And I'm going to show courage today because for 19 years that I've been married to Howard, he's been trying to get me to go on stage with him or get involved with some of his public speaking, which is something I'm not exactly thrilled about. So today I'm going to give it my first try here, be gentle with me, and talk about this virtue, which is really largely a demonstration of our website, which I've been very involved in from the beginning. Um, on our Dentaltown website, the most exciting thing on the website are the message boards. On the message boards on the main page, we have all of the different, we have 89 subject categories to cover. Um, everything from amalgams to clinical case presentations all the way through. Whoops. At the bottom of the main page, we also show our statistics and our active users. That's kind of like the whole virtue of courage, um, showing our numbers, showing what kind of activity there is online, showing how many people visited each month. But what makes it fun for the users is you can actually see who else is online at that time and how busy the website is. Um, another way to see what's going on in a given time on the message boards is to click on the Days Active Topics. The Today's Active Topic button is available from virtually any page on the website. And then you can really kind of get a feeling for the pulse of what's being discussed on the website, what topics are hot that day and what people are excited about. One of the things about the Dentaltown website that really makes it special for dentists, it's something that wasn't available really before Dentaltown, is benchmarking. Finding out how do other dentists do things, you know, discover how others do something better than your own firm or dental office so that you can imitate or leapfrog the competition. Um, when you're practicing alone in your office with your receptionist and hygienist and dental assistant and you're the only dentist, sometimes you want to know, well, how does the guy next door do it? <clears throat> but you might not feel comfortable asking him. You can go online on Dentaltown and see real wet glove dentists sharing their opinions and expertise in a non-threatening environment on the internet because it's not the guy next door who may see the same patients as you. If you have a dumb question, you can go on and ask. Um, you can also go on, one of the most common ways that dentists use the website is they get curious about a subject or they hear somebody mention CapTech or their lab guy mentions, you know, why don't you do CapTech in there, CapTech, what's that? So you can go to Dentaltown <clears throat> and do a keyword search, put in CapTech and then get all different kinds of search information and read up for a while and then you don't have any more questions about CapTech because you've heard real, word den real world dentists talk about how they use it. Whoops. <laughs> Um, when you're online looking at information, sometimes you want to know a little bit more about the person whose opinion, who's sharing their opinion. So you can click the view profile information and then get some more information. Not every user fills in their profile. We wish everyone would go to the My Profile button and update your profile. But for example, this guy says what university he attended, what year he graduated, and it lets you know a little bit more about the people that you're speaking with. Howard and I have been so fortunate and excited about the incredible growth that Dentaltown website has had since it first started in September of 2001.
Right now there's over 60,000 people who've registered and talk regularly on the website, so we've been really thrilled about how much the membership has grown. It's also been exciting to see how basically, because of the internet, it has no boundaries, we're picking up basically the English-speaking people from around the world. People from 38 different countries have logged on and participated. Um, so the internet really does break down the boundaries of nationality and, and time and space. There we go. Um, as I mentioned before, and as Howard has mentioned, um, the importance of CE online. We are very excited to be offering CE online now with Dentaltown. And we are very excited that we are AGD, PACE, and ADA SERP approved. You can go online on the CE section and search through all the different courses. More are be being added all the time, so that's exciting. We've talked about the message boards and people talking on the message boards but you can also go through the case presentation. Sometimes it's nice to be able to add pictures. So in the case presentations, you can search by different categories or see what's active that day and really see um, the pictures and cases. And as Howard mentioned before, share your ideas with other doctors and look at the cases and the work that they're doing and ask them questions. Every year we do the Townie Choice Award, which is another outstanding ways, way to find out what other dentists are doing in their practice and which products they're using. As you know, without all of the wonderful products in dentistry, we'd all be practicing with you know minimal tools on a sidewalk with sticks and rocks, as Howard says, but with all of the great input from dental manufacturers and all their products, you get to use all kinds of high-tech materials that make you, the doctors, look good. So we have the Townie Choice Award each year so that doctors can vote on their favorite products in given product categories and share what they like the best. Um, and then each year in the magazine, we print the results and give out the Townie Choice Awards. If you want to go back and see, for example, who won an award in a previous year, this shows the listings of the 2003 Townie Choice Awards. You can also find the 2004 Choice Award result winners, and right now we're voting for the 2005 County Choice Awards. Um, but again, we show all the different product categories that we can think of and who the winner is. If you want to go in and see more detail, if you click on a category, you can see more detail about the products and which products got what percent of the vote, so you can really get some details. You might find that your favorite didn't win, but it was you know in the first, second, or third, so you feel very comfortable about using that product. So that's good, and you'll find basically, hopefully, all the different categories of products, services, and equipment that you would be interested in. Another section on Dentaltown website, which has been extremely popular, is the classified ad section. It's free and it's easy to use. You can search through jobs available, looking for employment, equipment for sale, practices for sale, and uh, submitting um, an office space. This is an example of a search of equipment. When it has a little camera icon next to it, well then you know there's actually a picture of the product. But what's good about it is that we just hook you directly with the person selling it. We're not taking a percentage or a commission here. It's free to post an ad, free for you to, I mean you can buy something from the other person, but we're just connecting two different people, one who has something that they want to sell and somebody else who wants to buy it. But we just connect you directly with them. They can put their phone number and their email and you can just take it from there. We also have a monthly poll on Dentaltown, which gives valuable information to help run your practice. You can look through the polls. You can go back through the archives of other polls back through the history that we've put on. If you're curious about something, you can search through, oh, here's one about digital cameras and, and see what other people voted for or what their poll opinions were on the use of digital cameras in their office and different uh, different techniques and products. So you can search through there through the archives. We keep them up since the beginning. It's interesting to see also how a poll on endodontics might have changed from a few years ago to now. And then each month we take information from that current poll and print it in the magazine so that the active users on the website can share that information with the much larger audience of the readers of the magazine. Another section that really keeps you connected with the uh, dental industry are, is the press release section. You can go through here kind of like the uh, dental newspaper and find out what's going on with different companies. You can do in this one I did a search for 3M SB and you can read the press releases for 3M SB or search for a product that you're curious about. 
We have some other buttons that connect you with some resources. One of the fun ones is the uh, U.S. Air Force um, has a website where they review products. It's kind of neat to look at their website because there's no advertising dollars attached. Sometimes people um, worry about the information that they're looking at and if there was uh, somehow if it was in influenced by marketing. This is neat um, that here you can look at product evaluations. You can search by category and get detailed information and then summaries and conclusions you know of, of what the uh, government researchers or the army researchers thought about a product. So it's just another interesting opinion that you can get. The newest section on Dental Town, or one of the other new sections, is what we call Dental Town Plus. That's where we put the online CE and we're also working on getting a um, selection of insurance and finance products there. So we've teamed up with a company to offer equipment financing at good group rates and credit card processing um, also at a good group rate that we got for the Dentaltown users. The product gallery on Dentaltown Plus is a place where companies can put information about their products direct from the company to give their side of the story and highlight and feature their products. Hygiene Town is our second magazine and second website and the two websites are very similar about the benefits and features but now you can let your hygienist get connected. If you're a dentist and you've gotten excited about Dental Town and if it's benefited you in your practice in any way well then you certainly want to share that same ability to your hygienist and now they have their own place to go on Hygiene Town. Um, they also have the monthly poll to help them be connected with their peers and views on uh, products and techniques and hygiene. They have the message boards, similar categories, to have hygienists discussing their opinions. And it's kind of fun also with Hygiene Town because it's a newer website. Um, everybody gets to watch it grow like we watched Dental Town grow over the years. There are also classified ad ads on Hygiene Town, and I think that uh, looking for a job or looking for employment on that is fun. Another way you can submit ads and browse through the ads, it's all free. The CE calendar lets you find CE courses that are in your area, or if you want to become a speaker, you can submit your own event. Just like everything else on Dental Town and Hygiene Town, it's completely free to use the CE calendar or the classified ad section. And we also have press releases on Hygiene Town. So now that I have presented the website, we're going to go back to the next virtue, back to Howard. Thank you.